Well, Silly Gurke mal wieder hier am Start mit der Dauerwerbesendung für Laser Gurkenland, den gratis erreichbaren Anarchie-Server mit der IP 149.202.1 äh, Alternativ natürlich mit der Domain sillyhoon.com erreichbar. Da joinen wir jetzt mal direkt. Und äh, wie versprochen schauen wir keinen Aaron Jones Talk mehr. Deswegen schauen wir heute einen Aaron Jones Talk mit dem Titel Security Introduction to Exploits. Ja, yet another introduction. Wahrscheinlich wird er uns wieder irgendwas erzählen über... Oh mein Gott, ich habe eh alles wieder vergessen. Wie hieß der Dude von der Silk Road? Ah, oh, fuck. Ich weiß seinen Namen nicht mehr. Ähm, genau. Wahrscheinlich wird er von dem was erzählen. Und dass man jede Zeile vom Linux-Kernel lesen soll. Und sonst so die üblichen Geschwafeln und wahrscheinlich wieder viel Neues. Äh, Aaron Jones, bin mittlerweile großer Fanboy. Mal wieder hier vom Channel Brian Clough. Also, let's go. Okay. Tonight's uh, discussion is going to be on exploit. It's discussion. Sort of an to exploit. And, this is uh, a discussion. We're gonna have a lot of fun, I think. I'm hoping. I'm hoping that we're going to have a really, really, really large amount of fun here. If you want to follow along, uh, if you notice, we were showing the Wi-Fi credentials and stuff like that. If you'd like to follow along, you can go to Retro64XYZ. .github.io I'm having to use that as sort of a halfway house for my web page right now. Um, so it's on the GitHub pages. If you want to head over there, you can actually click on Introduction to Exploit. And you can follow along on the web page and see everything that I'm doing up here. Uh, and then plus, we'll have, it'll also give you access to uh, uh, it'll show you some code highlighting so, I guess we will go ahead and get started. So our performance objectives tonight, at the conclusion of this course, you will be able to identify at least three types of attack vectors. You're going to identify a piece of software that can be used to execute a brute force attack, at least one. We're going to identify what the main concepts of two-factor authentication is. We're going to identify a Linux operating system that is used for penetration testing. We're going to identify a product used to manage two-factor authentication. Ja, und jetzt, das klingt ja echt spannend. Nice, irgendwie sollte ich irgendwas langweiliges machen dabei, damit ich dem Talk gut folgen kann. Ja, ich glaube, Strip Mining ist ganz gut. Boah, sind hier viele. Aber vorher lasse ich mich noch töten von den Viechern hier. Hat der überhaupt Sharpness? Looten und Unbreaking. So, there are some warnings in there, please eat them, okay? So, we're going to be talking about actual attacks, methods, and then also mitigation techniques. We want to look into how we can protect our users from these kinds of attacks. For ourselves, you know. Uh, now, the vast majority of online attacks are opportunistic and they're designed to take advantage of user ignorance, fear, or laziness. Okay? If you're not doing your updates, if you're using admin, admin is your logic. If you're not taking care of your server, if you're not being a good neighbor with everybody else out on the internet, there's a good chance that you're going to end up becoming a victim. And if you're not, you're not going to be the only victim. Let's put it that way, okay? When somebody gets a hold of your server, they want it for a reason. All right. They want Continue. your computer for a reason. They want access to your email for a reason. There is a benefit to them when they get access to what you have. Okay? So not only are you harmed, but you're just another nexus towards being able to harm others. We also want to make sure that you're aware of these attacks. Because if you're unaware, it makes you an easy target. If you don't know what to look for, it's real hard to defend against right? You have to be able to think like these individuals. You have to understand what they're doing and why. What is the value in what they're doing against you, okay? Uh, in addition to that, you want to boost your confidence here, because that's important as well. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the age-old, hey, this is the IRS, and you owe us $10,000, if you send me 50 bucks right now, you know what, we'll let it fly. <laughs> That's a very popular scam. They pick up the phone, they start randomly dialing, or they use their 
American Association of Retired People's phone number list, and they just start hitting people. And if they can get 10 people out of that list, guess what? They made a, you know, more than minimum wage. So we want to increase your confidence to understand what they're doing, make you safer by understanding these things. And then, of course, we also want to talk about best practices and methodology. So number six, when I talked about up here, identifying the training systems that will make our users more likely to stay safe, I kind of want to share something with you here that I follow and a lot of the, the law enforcement officers that I know follow, a lot of the people guard, uh, or even this ethos. If you train like you fight, you will fight like you train. And this, uh, this applies to us as software developers, as computer programmers, as server administrators. Wow. No. If you are using real information, if you have that tactile yeah. of whatever it is that you're doing, you will better understand what the people out good. there are doing, what they want from you, why they want it. All the things that I just covered, everything there is summed up in you have to understand what's really Not going on out in the world for you to be able to defend against it. And if you don't know what they can do, you're not going to be able to stop them. We're going to learn how the opposing forces move. Have we got an efficiency drive for level 30? What the fuck? I hope all of us coming out of this a little bit more enriched. And I really do appreciate that. But we have to understand that that opposing force is out there doing the same thing. Every day they're sitting on web forums trading information. There are people out there selling botnets, there's people out there selling access to code, everything that they need to be able to accomplish their goals. And so we're sort of on the defensive here, right? We have to wait until somebody fits towards us in this kind of problem. So you want to focus on these real life scenarios. So the first thing I want to talk to you about. Okay, also die Schuhe und die Pickaxe sind im Arsch vom Enchantment, was braucht man denn noch? Und schwer? 
Unbreaking 3. Unbreaking 3. Now, das legitimate passwords used in other products are often the fuel that Egal, ich habe auch versperrt. I'm not ashamed to say. Das ist ich nicht gehört. Sorry, Leute. Passwords used in other products are often the fuel that feeds a dictionary attack. Mm. I'm not ashamed to say that ja, Fire ist doch nice. Adobe products. And guess what? Adobe system was owned probably two years ago. I would say. And I was a victim in that attack. Somebody was able to get into Adobe stuff. And they got access to usernames, they got access to passwords, they got access to a whole bunch of information. And I was in that. And so they had access to the password and username that I used that Adobe product and had the little message and of course not that I noticed the difference but I'm sure my email received an influx in spam hmm. just because of that situation oh. individuals are going out there and they're finding the products that they can get into to get access to those users and of course this is going to go back to our mitigation we are going to discuss that but they get into the okay, Dias. Ja, ganz beliebt, ne? Schimpfwörter und sowas und Passwörter zu verwenden. You 
have time, just sit down. Take a little bit of time. Start looking through this. Uh, another thing that I like to have my students do uh, is I will have Linux to go in and pull down one of these large passwords lists and use grep and take and have run I grep been over it. Found... Look for some words that you awesome. use for passwords. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll resume. And I will tell you right now, I've had people go, oh, whoa, I found my stuff in here. So it happens. In addition to that, I have another list right here, 10 million passwords available in the torrent. And that also includes usernames. So you can go in there, and all you have to do is regex by space. So you can get the full set of usernames and then the full set of passwords with a regex by space, set them up to a variable put them in an array, whatever it is that you want to do, but you have a tool right there to be able to enumerate. And that's a big list, right? 10 million? Oh, and that's the person who curated this, made sure that there were no copies, there were no duplicates, nothing, okay? So, something to keep in mind. In, it, in addition, you're gonna see some checksums here. Uh, if you were to pull down that torrent that's up here, uh, there are some checksums there so that you can verify that the torrent is real, correct uh, if you feel inclined to do so. However, I do want to touch on the question that was asked. Shouldn't they be hashing this stuff? Shouldn't they be taking care of this stuff? Case in point, proof. There's plenty of places to go out there and find people's passwords. It's all available out there in the wild. So, Geht es hier lang auch? I don't know. Also, eigentlich geht es in die Richtung. Let's talk ja, about our first application of the And what we're going to talk about here is WP Scan. And WP Scan is an application designed to work as a vulnerability scanner as well as provide some ability to conduct attacks against WordPress websites. Now, I'm touching on WP Scan first because guess what? A whole lot of the internet runs on WordPress. A whole And if you are a WordPress administrator and you're not on shared hosting, I am sure if you're like me, you have tail F your log and sat there and watched as people have attempted to enumerate into your site. So for those of you who are new or don't know me, I'm a huge fan of Docker. Love Docker. Docker's a great tool. So oh, that's how you know you call in all of my lessons, what I try to do <coughs> I try to make sure that there are either Docker machines available or Docker machines that I create so that people can follow along with this stuff. I have a Docker machine here for WP Scan that I located, and that comes from the WP Scan team. And all you have to do is run Docker pull WP Scan team forward slash WP Scan, and guess what? You're up and running. You have access to WP Scan. Uh, if you are interested in enumerating users for a WordPress blog, the command is right here. Docker run, WP scan team, forward slash WP scan. Uh, you send it a URL, tell it to enumerate, and give it U for users. And it will actually sit there and try to find all of the users for the WordPress site for you. Again, entropy. If I start with nothing, it's a lot harder to get in. But if you start by building a foundation, if I know what users exist, well, that just reduced me from having to search for user A, user B, user C, so on and so forth, to, oh, there's Aaron. Aaron's got a user on that server. I know what his username is. Great. I can start there. In addition to that, I've got a word list here for brute forcing a WordPress account. So if you're using Docker, uh, we're not going to touch too much on Docker security, but you can provide a Docker machine, a folder you can expose. That folder would be the keyword if you decide to Google this stuff. You can expose a folder to Docker. If you do so, you can place your password list inside that folder, and then you can tell Docker, hey, here's the password list. Well, you're enumerating through there. Go ahead and use this right here to go look. And that would be your command right here. Uh, I'll go over it just a little bit. We'll touch on it because it's, I hope everybody understands this is a mixed room of different skill levels, so we're just going to work at a baseline, okay? So, you have docker run-d, and then I'm exposing the folder. 
I'm using that tilde right there with a forward slash word list because that's my home directory. As I'm saying, hey, word list right here is my folder. I'm going to expose that folder to root word list for the Docker machine itself. So once you understand how that works right there, it's very, very easy to sort of understand exactly what we're doing. And then of course, I'm spawning WP Chansey, forward slash WP Chan, and then I give it a URL. And it's a little cut off because I'm using that reader mode, but if you're following along at home or you decide to go to the web page, fantastic because it'll all be there for you in an easy to copy and paste method. In addition to that, another very nice thing about WP Chan is they keep lists of vulnerable plugins. And so you can go in there and you can enumerate over the plugins. If you want to know all the plugins that are being used by that WP web page, fine. You can go in there and you can find that out. But you can also tell it, you know what? I don't care about any plugins except for ones with known vulnerabilities. It's that easy. It's extremely simple to enumerate over these objects just say, I just need to know whether or not this thing has a hole in it or not, and can I exploit that hole? So, continuing on with the theme of brute forcing and enumeration, we're also going to talk about InCrack. And InCrack is a gold standard tool for cracking network authentication. It can be used to attack SSH, RDP, and more. RDP being remote desktop. Windows boxes. This is this tool is extremely powerful and comes from the same people who brought you Nmap. So if you're familiar with Nmap, which you probably are, if you've taken some of the courses that we talked about earlier during this uh, past couple of months, I did I did discuss Nmap. Well, guess what? Incrack is another tool, and there's tools like Jack the Ripper, Medusa. There's a whole bunch of different cracking tools that are out there. I like Incrack. I think it's a, a pretty I've already got a Docker machine for it, of course. Nice so, uh, I found it to be useful for my needs. Obviously, there are alternatives. And uh, and they're so long they're pretty easy to find. So, Docker run dash v hacker files, hacker files, we can expose oh, fuck. A folder to it, uh, and then we can set up Docker in crack here. And then, if you want to enumerate passwords within crack, you can do so with the command. When you run this command right here, it'll actually drop you into an SSH terminal for that Docker machine. And so then you can run that command almost as if you're native on the box. You're essentially inside of the box. You run incrack dash p for port 22. You can set up your root, your user of root, and then switch p for your password list, which you head on further up, you find lots and lots of passwords in the password list. And then we give it an IP address. And it will sit there and it will enumerate through that. In addition to that, uh, it supports threading, so if you want to speed it up, you can increase the number of threads. However, if you're practicing this uh, locally, like with a virtual machine, if you're going to be practicing this stuff at home, understand that your virtual machine uh, potentially can be kind of limited. So you can essentially DOS your box, denial of service the box, when you're sitting there enumerating over passwords and multiple threads, trying to get in. So just keep that in mind. Uh, Performance-wise, it's not going to be as good on your local machine as it may be when you're running something like this off of a server located externally hooked up to a great big old gigabit pipe. So now that we talked about all these cool toys, let's talk about mitigation. Because that's important. How do we defend against this stuff? It's easy, right? A handful of commands. I go in, I download a couple of things, I dump them in a folder, set up Docker, and I've got tools for breaking the password. I've got tools for attacking RDP. I've got tools for essentially everything, right? So mitigating the dangers of a brute force attack is relatively trivial. Hey, sounds pretty good, right? A properly configured system can provide all of the tools necessary to prevent the general and continuous brute force attack that is normally run over the internet and targeted at any machine willing to accept the internet. Again, for those of you who have your own servers, if you ever KLS the log on your server, you will see within a few minutes or even a few seconds of your server coming up online, you will start to see people trying to get in over SSH. You will start to see people checking ports because it's automated. 
There are people who are running computers around the clock, mass scan, and just checking the internet, mapping it, seeing what's available, what's out there, and what can I do. So let's talk about the first thing, two-factor authentication. Now, two-factor authentication could be used for SSH. Yes, really. SFTP, WordPress, and almost every connection that requires a login. If you are running SSH on your server, it is possible to add two-factor authentication to that server, and you can use an application and SSH into the box, pull out your cell phone, take a look at the randomly generating code, type that code in, and then get access to the box. One more defense against somebody being able to get in. And of course, we're going to go into SSH keys as well and how all of this stuff builds upon itself so that you can add layers of security. And I use this term in every single class that I talk about. It's, it's layers. There is no silver bullet. There is no one tool that if you just install this single thing on my server, I don't have to worry about anybody else because it's like a golden cage that protects me against everything. It's just not out there. We're building layers upon layers over the top of all of our stuff. So you can add two-factor authentication to a server and then require a device to allow access, and this is going to help mitigate some threat actors because they will still be unable to log in, even with a username and password, if they do not have the one-time pass required. The two-factor authentication device will generate a key that must be used for login, and the main concept of two-factor authentication is something you have in the device and something you know in your password. And of course, when we're moving over here towards SSH keys, then we would have something we have, like in our device, and then something we also have in our SSH key, and then potentially also having our password for that SSH key. So any user who is going to log into a server over SSH, SFTP, or similar should do so using an SSH key that they generated in hand. They may also wish to add a password to the SSH key as well as use a strong password or using sudo. If you are using a password manager, your password should be 20, 30 characters long. You want to use the maximum length of password and every single password should be original. And every time when I sudo, I give it like so long a password I give. Are you kidding me? We are adding two-factor authentication. We are adding SSH. Uh, we are adding keys. And then, even after you get into the box, we are mitigating the threat of somebody getting in. And if they do not have the pseudo password, we're reducing the amount of damage that they can do. Again, layer after layer after layer. And there is some complexity to this. I will admit to it. There is. There is a level of complexity that requires you to have proper documentation and proper management of all of these tools. And you have to put in time and effort for all of these items to work. I have no idea in which direction I'm going. Or how I'm going to go back. So strong passwords. Let's just get it out of the way. You have to use a password manager. You have to. Nobody's going to remember 150 different passwords, all 30 characters long. I can't. I have in my password manager approximately 840 accounts. Tja, okay. und wo ist der Password right Manager in der Cloud bei irgendwem, dem man nicht vertraut? For, for Oder lokal auf der Maschine, die, wenn man sie verliert, alles im Sack ist? Ich habe Zugang zu IP-Adressen, ich weiß alle die Keys, die ich nie benutzt habe. All of that stuff. Just a ton of information. And it's all historical and made available for me, so that if I ever need to look back at any of this stuff, I can say, oh yeah, yeah, I know. Okay, jetzt bin ich so, auch you should be using very strong passwords that include a random jumble of letters, numbers. Ich bin am Sack. Soll ich jetzt hier ausziehen? Macht das überhaupt dann? Habe ich irgendwo? No webpages out there that will tell you your password has to be exactly eight characters long, all lowercase, oh, and it can only be eight characters. Seen them like that. So, where possible to employ both tools. In addition to that, I hope everybody is fully aware, if you have a choice between using a text message or using like a Google Authenticator, you should always use the Authenticator. 
indicator is not the text message. Because the text message opens you up to a completely different vulnerability in terms of if you are using text message for securing your device, somebody else is going to pick up the phone and call their contact at one of the phone companies. And they're going to tell that person, hey, look, send their text messages to this SIM card. And they will get into the computer that, or account that you have. They will send that information to their phone, and they will get access to your data. And if you don't think that that's happening right now, Linus Tech Tips in YouTube, you can actually go on there and go look him up. They hit him just a couple of months ago. So he was sitting there making a video, and his cell phone didn't ring, didn't go off, nothing happened, because guess what? It didn't have a connection to the internet anymore. And the next thing he knows, somebody comes running in and interrupts the video film to let him know that their Twitter had been taken over, a whole bunch of other uh, accounts had been attacked, and that somebody had access to his two-factor authentication. Because his two-factor authentication choice was a text message as opposed to an application. So if at all possible, avoid text message for authentication, because even today, people are still able to get into those accounts. They will find a way into your cell phone account, and it is not difficult when you think about it. If you pick up the phone and you make a phone call, and you already have some pretty extensive information about people, it is not hard to impersonate that person. Uh, for those of you who have been on the internet lately, if you are familiar with Celebrity Gate, all the new images that were leaked of different celebrities over the past couple of months, uh, a lot of that actually came from an original attack that happened to Paris Hilton's cell phone. Because her security question was, what's the name of my dog? Mm. Mm. It's Tinkerbell. And I know that because of the attack, not because I read the magazine. <laughs> Somebody was able to yeah. pick up the phone, pretend to be her. They asked, what's your security key? What's the password? That individual said, oh, it's Tinkerbell. And they said, yep, there is. And <gasps> we were able to send Duh. all of those Visual. celebrity phone numbers, all of their data, everything essentially from her cell phone was transferred over to another person's phone. And then that person used that information for all their nefarious stuff and then leaked it out onto the internet and it's been used for other kinds of attacks now as well. And so it all started with that original attack and then sort of blossomed out from there. Because how many people here would think to themselves, oh, I have to change my entire identity if somebody else was attacked? You know? Not everybody thinks about that. And that's what happens to these celebrities. You find a door in and once you get in, you pivot attack based on where you're located and who's available. So we need to use a password manager. We need to use strong passwords. And we need to use stuff that people can't find out off of OSINT, which is Open Source Intelligence, OSINT. Your backup questions, your safety questions, should not be real information about you. When they ask you at a bank, what was the name of your mother's maiden name? None of your business. SpongeBob. Pick something else. Okay? Find yourself something else. I use random characters. I just go into the password generator and I just generate a 30 character password and I have literally had to sit there and read it off character by character to somebody on the phone in order to get access to the thing but you know what? It's none of their business. When they ask me, you know, what's your mother's maiden name? Guess what? <laughs> Get ready to write this down. Because I don't want them to be able to go online, throw my name into Google, spend some time searching, and figure out what my mother's maiden name is and use it against me. Same thing for all of you. Because it's that easy. OSINT is what it's called. So if you want to look into that, that's another term that you can write down for Guess what? It's used everywhere. Everybody uses OSINT. So every password needs to be unique. No two accounts should ever share a password. 
we should not give them any kind of information to pivot off of. That's extremely important. Oh, is der iron? Ah, okay, da kann man auf jeden Fall was entscheiden. Now, I have two links on the webpage, one for SAS Pass and one for CPASS X. I'm a huge CPASS X proponent. Love CPASS X. It helps people everywhere to use CPASS X. SAS Pass is pretty neat too, but this moves into you're not managing the data, somebody else is. You put stuff into SAS Pass, potentially that's being sent up to a, a central account. And so now you're putting trust in somebody else. CPASS, you're really putting your trust in yourself. Yeah. So you kind of have two choices here. And if you're just getting started with this kind of stuff, you need to make a decision, an informed decision about who you are on whether or not you can manage this. Is this information that you will expect? Is this information that you will do regular backups on? Do you know to take care of this stuff? Because you do not want to have to recover 840 accounts because you lost literally everything. And then in addition to that, all your backup questions are 30 characters long, random jump letters and numbers. Okay? So you have to think into the future, am I going to take care of this information? Am I going to keep it safe? Am I going to be able to defend it? Am I ready for this? Of course, both of these products are available on your phone, they're available on your computer, there's different applications available for them, there's a whole bunch of stuff, and there's one other benefit about SAS Pass that I want to go over, and that's the fact that it will carry your OTP stuff. So like your Google Authenticator, you can put that into SAS Pass, and you'll have all of that available to you within essentially one application. Again, one more thing to think about as you start adding layers of security. How do you want to manage this stuff? Then we're going to move to fail to ban. Fail to ban is pretty neat. A lot of people know that fail to ban works for SSH, SFTP, things like that, but it also works for web application layer. So it's a log parser, this is essentially what it does. Fail to ban will parse logs, and it works by monitoring common services to recognize patterns in authentication and mitigate attacks. If you have something that writes to a log, you can essentially use fail to ban. You just need to be able to write the regex to sit there and look at the log, identify a pattern, and then tell it to take an action. That's all fail to ban does, okay? So we can use fail to ban to monitor for attacks on SSH, SFTP, and look for things that are attacking our WordPress site. We can tell it, if you see somebody attempting to access our webpage at WP Admin, block that individual, stop them. Send them to null, do whatever it is that we want to do. And then later on in further classes, we'll also talk about Honeypot, where we can actually set up a server designed specifically to get people to pack it so that we can sit there and let them get in and get far enough that we can watch what they're doing and monitor their actions. But right now, we just want to block them. Okay? So that's what we discussed. Here. And this, of course, works with WordPress, Google, any web application. And you can write the log, there's a way to parse that log, get patterns in the log, and then you can work Then we also have IP access. We can limit access to the server by IP address, and we can make that a viable alternative to keep our server open. So some individuals will employ a country based list. Essentially, I will go in there and I will collect all of these African, Chinese, and Thailand IP addresses that are out there on the internet, IP4, and then I will say, if any kind of connection tries to come from one of these IP addresses, just say no. You can't connect. Mm, My yeah. webpage isn't for that country. Yeah, My well, nee, nicht schlecht. For, nee, der war gut. Uh, you know, anybody who's connected from a certain language or anything like that. There's a, there's a large number of lists. Ja, nee, war nicht schlecht. Go for it. But there's really two Die Längen sind auch Iron, okay. Die Rüstung ist ja voll am Arsch.
SSH connection, and as long as you have a username and password, hey, you're good to go. And then we have the Soviet style security. Nothing is permitted unless otherwise not. So the perfect example is a white man. No one Obviously, Soviet style is much easier to manage. Because if you're using the American file, you're going to find yourself in the Ich brenne so oft.
Android keep with the Android to your phone. You sit there and hit a button and immediately start fancy traffic off your cell phone. This is and probably five eight years ago. I don't know how that. But uh, another tool is Ettercat. And I'll open this real quick. And of course. Here is our GitHub for Ettercat. And you can head in here and there are plenty of instructions. Now, if you notice here, I'm not using Docker for Ettercat. And there's a reason for that. And it has to do with the way that Docker requires access to your system in order for Ettercat to run successfully. Okay? And we will get into that but I wasn't comfortable sending out an Ettercat image like out into the world with this being a potential issue until either I sit down and actually make my own Ettercat image or somebody trustworthy does as well. So Ettercat has two forms. You can get a graphical user interface or you can get a command line. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about the graphical user interface because it's really easy to use. Okay, Leute, ich glaub's reicht. Once you start Ettercat, and of course this is ich würde sagen, wir ziehen mal uh, weiter. Ich, ich weiß, ich wollte in dem Talk, in dem Talk uh, super gut aufpassen und so. Aber bisher ist jetzt noch nicht zu spannend. Uh, deswegen würde ich sagen, brechen wir mal auf. Das Zeug ist dann noch hier. Ah, okay, zweimal Level 30 werden noch am besten. Und dann, dann geht's los. Historically, the trade goes 
Es gibt ein neues, es wird echt so basic hier, es kann Injection, oh. sorry. In my opinion, that's pretty disgusting, to be honest with you. That yeah. data, that's no toxic issue. data. You don't need that. That is not something that your company needs. That's not something that you should be using. And of course, this is my opinion, and I'm just some dude. What do I know, right? However, in my opinion, that is toxic data that does not need to be collected. Because guess what? Who actually used it? 
individuals who gained illicit access to that database and started pulling this stuff down. They're the ones who got access to that data. And at no time should that data have ever been saved. And if you go to other web pages and you start looking around and you start thinking about all of the stuff that they need, this goes back to when I discussed entropy in one of the previous talks where I discussed the fact that we only need 33 bits of entropy to find out who you are, to unmask you, so you are no longer anonymous. Ich weiß nicht, wie wertvoll dieser Bumsi ist, ob das wirklich ein Slot wert ist. You generally don't need the data for There's a lot of information that people collect for no other reason than to have it. And then once they have that data, they can make it all work. And I disagree with that tremendously. I think that that's incorrect. And our thought process towards what kind of data we give out has to fundamentally change. Ja, Obsidian ist ganz nice, aber das lasse ich mal in der Base. Ah, ein Bett ist eigentlich gut. Nein, ich finde Schafe. So, again, here's that SQL query, all in its glory right there. Select from users where I don't want or want to want. As easy as that one raw post. And I have access to the entire user database. And there are plenty of people out there who have applications that they have access to that will go through your site and look for every single input and every spot where you can put data in and just randomly put different potential SQL injection attacks just to enumerate you the site and attempt to find out if it's vulnerable somewhere. And it doesn't take long to automate this stuff. Not at all. There is not a singular person sitting around frantically typing one equals one, one equals one, one equals one, mm. over and over and over inside of your web page. They have a script, okay? And of course, mitigation for SQL, the only mitigation that I can give you is the hope that if you are a developer or a programmer or you deal with those people, then you know to let them know, hey, you need to follow best practices. You need prepared statements. You need to do the right thing whenever you're building. Because if you're not doing that, you're potentially bringing harm to us, our customer base, you know, the company, or just the family. Whatever. Correct? Whatever level of relationship you have with that person, they need to understand that whatever it is that they are doing out there on the internet, they need to make sure that they're doing the right thing. I like to use the good neighbor policy. Not only with your server, but also with your computer program. You've got to be a good neighbor. So moving forward into social engineering. So we've tracked the SSH passwords, we've tracked the WordPress site, we know what is vulnerable on the site, we know what plugins we're not updating, we don't have any way to automatically update those plugins. But in addition to that, Was now it? that I've Automatisch updaten ist natürlich auch immer so eine schwierige Sache, wenn man die Updates nicht äh, überwacht und wenn dann plötzlich der Maintainer gewechselt ist und der neue vielleicht, ach ja, schwierig, alles schwierig. Every couple of, oh, I don't know, every couple of months. Now it's time to start doing the security and the whale fishing. Figuring out who's valuable and who I really want to get, whose account we really want access to, because I'm going to want to be able to pretend to be that person so I can get them to send me a check. Because guess what? So, social engineering is exception on the nature of behavior now this is sort of old but I like old technology for those of you who know me I love to play with like Commodore 64 and Big Sig and yeah, go for you know 10 print hello world 20 go to 10 <laughs> go to <right? laughs> <Yep. laughs> love it love all of that so let's talk about Frank Williams Abigail he spent time in the 1960s pretending to be a pediatrician. 
worked as a pediatrician, guess what? He was not a pediatrician. Alright, he worked in his life. But he was not a pediatrician. All he knew to do was carry around a medical book so he could reference that thing by running to the bathroom. <laughs> Somebody asked him a question, he'd head on over to the bathroom and real quick look it up, and then come back out and he was an expert. Okay? Nice. And then we have Kevin Mitnick. This one's probably more knowledge. More people would know who Kevin Mitnick is than they would know who Frank is. So Kevin Mitnick spent a little time in prison and was believed to be able to whistle and make missiles launch. The judge put him in solitary confinement and refused to allow him to use a telephone because they were terrified that if he whistled into the phone, the entire U.S. nuclear arsenal would just boop, launch out into space. Okay? They were terrified of this guy. He runs a successful business now, so I guess it's pretty okay. And then I want to talk about the best book in recorded history ever. And that's Mark Zuckerberg. And you have nearly 400 million people who have provided you with their most intimate data. Good job. You're living the life. If anybody doing social engineering, you're both barking. Oh, I'm sure it's a massive number, but I'm sure also some of those are like that probably have to do with like role playing games. It's a lot. So let's talk about the social media. And of course, we've got links. Always. The social engineering toolkit is available off the of tally as well, and we'll get to that. That is part of our learning. Fortune three. But there's Boy. a really nice breakdown in tally with really good instruction. So if you're interested in this tool, you really need to go over. Okay. Ich grad, ob ich noch and lo and behold, Axt guess what? I'm going to tell you this is probably the biggest Docker image out of the entire group. This is the biggest call the entire copy of tally inside of a Docker image. Was für Software? Okay. However, wieso Kali? Think of it like homework. Wieso? Go home and say I can do that better. Hey, die meiste Software läuft doch auch. Doesn't require us to pull down an entire copy of Kali to run what amounts to like 38 megabytes of Docker. But you can run Docker run dash id dash p, give it some ports, and then uh, the work social engineering toolkit, and it'll come right up for you. And in addition to that, I like the fact that with Docker, uh, one of the nice things is whenever we're done with it, if you don't need it anymore, of course you can destroy it and get rid of it. So that's always nice. Okay, so what's or you me? can go to Git and just clone it and set it up in the SEC folder. Das bisschen Eisen ist eigentlich auch gut. Put it in there and just work with the Docker there. Da kann man fast dann and of course, I've got our install stuff for it. You go into the um, directory, Pseudo Python setup Ooh, and then Pseudo Python SE toolkit. It actually has to run a whole bunch of stuff, and that's kind of why I would prefer to have that in the Docker image because it doesn't require um, any kind of elevated stuff outside of Docker, but it does require to run under Pseudo. So if you put it inside of Docker, it just kind of gives you that that buffer between you. So I prefer that. Once you do that, you can launch the SE toolkit, and it gives you a plethora of stuff that you can work with. Especially for those of us who work in cybersecurity and have to deal with like testing. Some of us uh, actually have to test our employees and give them like a little, hey, this is a, this is a scam. Make sure you don't click the button, everybody. Keep a track of who clicked the button. This is a great tool for the Because with this, Vielleicht sollte ich doch noch mal zum End Travel. Boah, aber das wäre eine, eine Meile. Hey. Ah. 
but this is sort of a one-stop shop because in addition to that, you can automatically tell it to go ahead and inject specific exploits or to use metasploits, and it takes care of all of that for you. So back in the day, we used to have to do it by hand, like, you know, trudge up the mountain in the snow both ways. But nowadays, you just really have a way to create a Docker image, hit a couple of keys, give it a URL, and you're in. Um, when I was looking at some of the tutorials, I really liked the fact that they said that if you can use a Chinese food menu, you can successfully use the toolkit. Numbers, okay? I need number one, I need number seven, and I need number ten. Hit the button, and then you're done, okay? It's very, very simple. It's easy to follow, very detailed instructions, but that's sort of what makes it so powerful is the fact that it doesn't take anything to make copies of the software. And to make those web pages that you see, where they tell you, yeah, put in your information here, or we're gonna shut down your Discover card. Those emails, all of that can be generated here. In addition to that, it takes a template, so you can either build your own templates, or use the templates that are provided. Uh, it's a one-stop shop. And this is particularly good for those of you in this room who do have to deal with employees that you're gonna have to send that kind of Neat. To verify that they're within, you know, that knowledge. That okay, for the three ideas, I'll go back to the next one. It's pretty neat. It really is. is and I like the fact that it's just on Docker, but I do wish the image was smaller. Digital extortion. Touch on crime. Okay? We've been talking about the tools. We've been talking about some of the... Mm. Why is this stuff worth people's time? Why are we spending time together on a Tuesday night trying to figure out how to defend against this? So digital extortion is a relative newcomer that is sweeping the world when it comes to crime. Individuals are able to demand payment in return for access to services and data from anywhere in the world. Regardless of operating system, there are a multitude of attacks that can be executed in order to find financial gain and others suffering some of these scams do not even require a successful nee, attack. Too okay. Okay. A little ingenuity a well and a well-worded email or advertisement that some people will pay out of fear or pay out of fear. Oder drei, ich kann die ja wegwerfen, ist ja kein Stress. This is the FBI. You owe us $10,000 in tickets. Send me money, but only a Bitcoin. <laughs> FBI, man kennt. Right. The first one, though, distributed denial of service. Big money maker. DDoS is being used for ransom, and this attack and using it for ransom is on the rise. Many companies are unwilling to reveal Whoa. the threat and regularly try Wieso to hide sind meine Schuhe nicht im Winter? If I can give you all oh. a recommendation, hiding that you've been attacked until the attacker comes forward and says, I told me people, ha ha ha, and also here's my evidence, it does not make you look good. It does not. That is poor form. It is extremely poor form. And I understand that there is a fear of backlash from investors. There is a fear that you will not be able to make capital. But I will tell you right now, with the security community, the people who actually work on this stuff, and the people who deal with this kind of stuff, there is a lot more honor in standing up and saying, yeah, I got something to say about that. Than there is in trying to hide it until the bad guy comes forward. And says, yeah, here's your whole database, and also here's pictures of the inside of your house. Ja, ich mache mir eben noch neue Schuhe, weil Schuhe. Ja, hier sind drei. Oh, und da wäre. Oh. And then next thing you know, somebody has access to it. They're setting it up to repeatedly curl requests, somebody's web page. And the next thing you know, somebody's knocking on your door to let you know, hey, we're shutting down your internet because your house is being used for your DOS attack. So it started off with things like convincing people to use the orbit my own campus. Hey, all you gotta do is put in a URL in the box and hit pass. Orbit. Ha, ha, ha. And guess 
what, a lot of those people who were using that tool, the FBI came in, kicked in the door, and they used the mic. <laughs> Boah, nee, das ist jetzt fetter vor dem oder so. Vielleicht sollte ich erstmal schauen. This is a real threat. This is an actual danger. All right? There are people who are victims to this that cannot handle it. And I know some of us are sitting here and we're thinking to ourselves, you know what, if somebody sent me an email like that, I'd just write my boss and be like, you know what, boss, I screwed up. And if you want a copy of the video, you hit me up first. You know? When we're looking at it from 100 yards, we can think to ourselves, yeah, I'm pretty tough. But for mm. some people, it's not like that. It was a major embarrassment to the point that they could not handle it. They chose a permanent solution to a temporary problem. So it's important that you're educated about these things, that you understand what they're doing. This crime is prevalent in the Philippines, big time in the Philippines right now. I'm talking there are people who have made enough money out there in the Philippines that they're buying entire neighborhoods. The lady who was arrested essentially bought an entire block and set up her own internet cafe where she brought in 13 and 14 year old girls to become essentially sexual predators. Where they would go out and look for people to convince, to show themselves or to participate in Boah, diese Drecksschaufel. Get them recorded and then use it to, hey, pair to the stick, bud. So, after you earn millions of dollars, I'm sorry, I was incorrect. She was avoided in the right direction. Here was someone? Uh, they did catch her though. What? They did execute an arrest. What? Was I? No. Was I? Here. Ach du Kacke. Something to keep in mind. Okay? 
Als ob. No way. They don't need to break into your system. Somebody just has to be smart enough to make you make a mistake. If you're not careful, yeah, ich gehe in die richtige Richtung. If you're not thinking things through, you could very quickly become a victim. Krass. Without ever gaining physical access to your machine. Because that's sort of the cool thing, right? The, the hacking, the physical access, the, the tactile thing. Oh, that's But sometimes it's right. not about that. Sometimes it's just about having a little bit more knowledge than the other person, or just a, to be a little bit more vicious. That's the only requirement. And then we have the big one that's always in the news. This one, this is the one that gets talked about a lot. Ich hätte ein Bett im Inventar mitnehmen können, nicht Genius. Oder wenigstens zwei Eisen. I don't know. So, ransomware is software that can encrypt files and also work as a control system to force users to contact the locker in order to receive the unlock credentials for payment. Most ransomware works using Bitcoin as the intermediary tool for financial transactions between the criminal and the victim. Warning. Y'all, y'all see that? Warning, okay? For real, real, not for play plays. <laughs> that right there. You have the warning, Mr. Mason. With an actual functional attack. However, in the readme, you can get the password for it, okay? But please do not experiment with that, especially not here. And don't go home and tell people. Jungs, was ist denn hier los? Alter. Oh. Game crap. What the fuck? Microsoft. For real? Oh. Oh. Okay, ich, ich denke, das war's mit der Folge. Das war äh, Aaron, Aaron Jones, ähm, Security Introduction to Exploits. Wir sind jetzt bei einer Stunde und 16 Minuten und 16 Sekunden. Wahrscheinlich wird es dann in der nächsten Folge weitergehen, wenn ich nicht gerade mein Minecraft gelöscht habe. LOL! Äh, okay, das war Silly Gurke auf Silly Huhn. Äh, auf Lasergurkenland mit der Domain sillyhuhn.com. Tschüssi!